So today I'm joined by Ed Warburton, an experienced art advisor, dear old friend uh, that's been working in the art industry for over five years. Joining the industry as an art consultant straight out of university and now is lucky enough to offer some of the most impressive and sought after works in the post-war modern and contemporary landscape. He currently manages Clarendon Fine Arts flagship store in Mayfair. Today we're going to be talking about the very mystical world of art, investing in art and why people should consider art as an alternative asset. And how is it that people make money from art? Well, we'll find all of that out today. Um, Ed, it's a pleasure to have you. It's good to be here. Um, so I think for most people, I think we just have to assume that they know nothing about this world of art mm. um, and it's a completely new concept to them. Loads of people think it's ridiculous. Other people love it. Um, but what is it exactly that you do? So my role really is um, advising clients in the post-war modern contemporary landscape. So this would really be from 1900s, 1901, the birth of the modern movement with names such as Picasso, Dali, Brack, which I'm sure you've heard of, all the way through from the 60s, 80s, and up until present day street artists such as Banksy, Mr. Amazing. Brainwash, ones that you have seen on your streets here in London. And this is for a wide range of clients, people who have never bought work before or experienced collectors looking to bolster their collection in a certain movement. Now, simply, this is a daily basis thing. I also manage the flagship gallery, which means curating the works, making sure exhibitions are looking smart, we have the right pieces in. And of course, it's an inviting and welcoming environment for clients who have 2,000 pounds to spend, yeah. or they're up to a couple million. That's amazing, that's amazing. See, it's just such a fascinating world because it's so different to like what other people usually say they're doing. Mm. Um, but what, day to day, like, what is it that you're doing as an art advisor? Day to day really is just running and managing a portfolio like you would maybe in a traditional asset, whether it be equities, fixed, fixed income. Yeah. Um, so you're making sure they have up to date evaluations, maybe presenting them with works which are coming to market, which would be relevant for them, their yeah. portfolio, either something already that they have or maybe a new artist that kind of would diversify yeah. in that respect. That's, that's so interesting, just like thinking so straight away, just thinking of you as like someone who really is looking after their clients' money. But the asset that you're doing that through is artwork. Absolutely. And just like taking a step back and thinking of it in that way is so fascinating because, of course, of course, that's the case. Um, but it's obviously not something many people consider because it's never been something that's open to everyone or people perceive it to be reserved for the ultra wealthy or high net worth individuals. Um, but obviously that's changing, right? Yeah, absolutely. I think the art market has you know, had this reputation of being extremely incestuous, very hard to get into, you know, kind of like a, uh, a secret club where only yeah. the upper echelon of the market could ever be in the last couple hundred years. But I think over the last five, 10 years, barriers for entries have been really broken down by galleries such as Clarendon, for example, my CEO's yeah. USP is to make sure every single person feels welcome when they come in. Yeah. So, you know, you're breaching that gap because they could have, as I said, 2,000 or 2 million. But also the age of digitalization has yeah. massively acted as a catalyst to kind of bring new collectors our age who have maybe a bit of money, maybe off Bitcoin or yeah. stocks, professionals who have been in the industry for a few years, want to invest their cash in something that they love, they yeah. can hang on the wall, but obviously they understand the investment capabilities. And this is where, of course, online connectivity yeah. and websites are coming into play. That's so cool. Like, honestly, that actually just sounds so interesting. And it's amazing to see that actually it's something that's been opened up to young people as well and mm. you're seeing that obviously a lot yourself um but how on earth <coughs> does some how on earth does one get into the world of selling fine art like how, <laughs> how, the, how does that happen like obviously we've known each other for years yeah and yeah. i remember when you first started selling art i was just like how's he done that like how's he gone from <laughs> not quite sure myself to be honest with you i think um i think obviously went back to university after we both finished our placement in london and it gave me a really good understanding of kind of what I wanted to do and what I didn't want to do. Yeah. And I think um, I was very naive and thought um, I would wait until something comes along when everyone else was you know, getting their Excel spreadsheets out, yeah. you know, getting Virgin, Vodafone, Barclays, Lloyds. And I just saw this one job pop up and it was graduate art consultant in Mayfair. Um, and, you know, two just interviews later, two weeks out of university, I joined Maddox which is a fantastic gallery on Maddox Street, on Regent wow. Street, Mayfair. And that was really the birth of it. So I think I was quite lucky to yeah, go into yeah. it. I hadn't done a lot of research around the world, but I was very lucky, I feel, to be at the right time, right place. Did you, did you have a background in art? 
Well, I mean, I'd worked at an auction house before, a really local one, yeah. uh, where my family based in, in yeah. Berkshire. Um, and that would be as a porter or just general maintenance. Sick. My grandfather was an auctioneer, albeit in property, but he was always yeah. in love with arts and whatnot. I think from there that kind of galvanised me to really go into an industry I have a passion for, yeah. but utilise kind of the business side, what we'd done as a yeah, placement, yeah. what I'd obviously studied at university. That's amazing. See, that's that's just so, so interesting. And did you have, did you study art at school or is that something? I was, uh, I think I got up to GCC Arts. I think I wasn't the best. I did design, which is really good fun. Uh, yeah. One of my main kind of uh, regrets is not doing art at A-level, but yeah. But it's so I, funny um, because this is something that surprises people about me. I actually got an art scholarship for, no for way. A-level. Did yeah, you? yeah, mate. <laughs> yeah, because it was, so uh, the school I went to, um, we there were scholarship exams for when we were going into A levels, yeah. and I went for the art scholarship. I thought there's no chance of me getting because I'm not like great. I was okay at fine art, um, and I did well at A level, but I basically flipped the script because everyone was doing like fine art drawings, and I just basically did my whole exam on Banksy and just like got some spray, like got some cans out and just started. <laughs> yeah. That's fantastic. Yeah, got some stencils. What, what was the stencil? What did you do? I, I can't even remember, but I just remember it being like really typical urbanized, like nice. um, copying. What's the piece called with, when he's throwing the glass bottle? Um, uh, fr- throwing the flowers. Throwing That's, the flowers, yeah. Uh, titled Love is in the Air 2004. Amazing, so you know way more than me. So I did that for the, I basically like, great played piece. on that. And yeah. I got the scholarship. Um, but I never ended. I didn't end up taking it. How crazy is that? And then I went into law. You you could have been um, you, an been artist you. on my rostrum. <laughs> yeah. I could be selling you now. Yeah, <laughs> mate. No, no. Yeah, we, we don't, people, it always surprises people when I tell them that. But That's you know, hey ho, we make decisions. Mm. Um, no regrets. But yeah, I have like so I have like a loose. I've always been like into art, but I kind of like moved away over the last decade. Mm. But I find it fascinating, and like I feel like I know so little about it now. And I think most people do find it quite intriguing. Um, but I guess like stripping it completely down to basics, like who on earth buys art? Like n- nowadays, like, if you had to like nail down like who your main customers are, like, who buys art? That's a really good question. I think um, it's a real mix, to be brutally honest. I th- where I am based in Dover Streets, my walk-ins, my footfall for the gallery uh, would be, I think, mainly... Um, clients who work in the area. It's not yeah. a residential area, obviously, like yeah, other galleries yeah. in Chelsea or Marlebone. Yeah. Um, we strictly have clients coming in on their lunch break, on the way to the arts club or on a meeting. These guys normally would work in finance or okay. some sort of business. So these guys are looking not just from the aesthetic perspective, yeah. but also the intrinsic value side. Yeah. So lots of my clients are, you know, all ages from 18 up to 50s, 60s, Great. men, women, whoever. Um, who come in, like the work, maybe already have a collection and go yeah. from there. I'd probably say a small amount of my clients would be international, I just deal with on the phone yeah. or indeed through a website inquiry. Most of it is what I quite like is face to face. You yeah. get to see the art, understand how it looks in the flesh, yeah. how you can envision it in the home. Yeah. Um, but no, I have to say it's a real mix. And actually, over the last six, 12 months, we've seen a massive uptake of people our age or yeah. professionals around the 30s getting really getting into art. That's amazing. So do you think like from your customer base, people are buying the artwork because they see it as a store of value? Um, is, is, and is that something that you support them through? I think I educate the clients mm. in that um, field. Obviously they'll come in because they're drawn to a certain piece, whatever it be, whatever medium or the artist. Mm. And then, you know, if it's what we call blue chip art, or at least a very established artist, I will make them aware from there that it's not just a beautiful piece to hang in the home. Yeah. You know, long term, it could be a great investment. You yeah. know, you look at the art market outperforming the S&P over 20 years. You look at, nice. you know, huge auction results for, you know, Jean-Marc Basquiat. I think we all know as an artist, yeah. you know, you could have bought in the 80s for $35,000, now selling for between 30 and 122 million. That's um, obviously, that is the 1% uh, yeah. percentile. However, you know, there are some great works out there at yeah. great prices that yeah. you can just buy and hold and yeah. watch, it, watch it grow over the long term. See, that's so interesting because obviously now is such a turbulent time in the financial markets, mm. right? And one of the things, and I have some friends who are like more, who actually work in financial services as like investment advisors on very traditional, um, um, uh, like either managing sort of assets for pension mm. funds mm. and other things. And I asked them like, and what they were really curious about is the interesting thing about art, it has no bearing on how the economy is doing. Cause it's, it's not, it's not, 
it doesn't go with the cycles of, of, of the stock market, for example, and it kind of like operates on its own. Do you have you have you seen different cycles of like what is it that makes things go up and, and down in the art world? Yeah, absolutely. So you kind of in answer to the first bit, you're absolutely right. What it, art has a low correlation mm. to um, the rest of the market, such as equities, where as we see now, the market's not doing too well, you yeah, know, yeah. due to massive macro factors and of course what's happening here in the UK. And art normally isn't really affected by it compared yeah. to the rest of the market, which is a good thing. I mean, harken back to maybe 2008 when we had our last recession. Yeah. Um, it probably took the UK market, what, five, ten years to probably recover. Yeah. Um, and it took the art market one year to that's recover. And that's crazy. purely from public visible results from auctions, which you can see and people can collate as data yeah. in 12 months. Obviously, there's the private sales side, which I operate in, which... Yeah untold millions throughout the world yeah. would be transacted on. Um, so yeah, it's a real it's a real boom at the moment and it has been really since 2008. I think obviously we have two paradigms at play. Yeah. I was speaking to you um, earlier on about this. You know, you have the classic collector, you know, the financials, which I was speaking about earlier, yeah, yeah, yeah. looking for the classic kind of post-war white alphas such as Tomby, Rothko, Warhol, um, yeah. seen in, you know, the front at the auction houses yeah. at Sotheby's or Christie's. But because of this kind of mad rush of NFTs, I think we'll get into a little bit, you know, we're seeing huge kind of multi-million pound, you know, Bitcoin um, you know, entrepreneurs originally introduced to the market That's through crazy, NFTs, yeah. now sitting at the front row and bidding on 19th century sculptures. So it's it's a real tough paradigm play at the moment. It's fantastic. Because there is see. just like a a new, like a new, new um, uh, cohort of ultra high net worth individuals that, that have become like crypto millionaires and billionaires. Literally overnight, right? yeah. Yeah, which yeah. is crazy. Yeah. And obviously now they're they're in this market of like, right, what do rich people do? I'm gonna buy some I'm gonna buy some art. Exactly. Yeah. Um, Validate my status yeah. or whatever it may be. Yeah. yeah, no. So that's super interesting. And do you think so but traditionally, do you think aside from the love of the artwork, mm. um that people or like um high net worth individuals have seen art as a, a viable alternative asset that they think, okay, I'm going to buy this and it's actually going to store yeah, my absolutely. value. You hear, you hear like rappers like Jay-Z talking about it all the time, like when they reach a certain status, they're like, I'm buying art now. Like, He's got a basket himself. Yeah. yeah. I think, no, you're absolutely right. What's interesting to see is, you know, obviously I think investment in art has become a lot more public recently because mm. lots of companies, you know, as a USPR, you know, selling it as an investment, such yeah. as Red 8 Gallery, Maddox. I think we were one of the first in London to create the kind of art and investment report to kind of educate clients on it as an asset. But really, this has been going for hundreds of years. Clients, mm. very high net worth individuals, family offices have always invested in art and very much seen it as a segment of a portfolio, yeah. as a luxury asset to invest in. See, that's, that's the interesting thing, because I think for everyone, they need to consider, and I think people do start to consider, like, especially when they get into investing and managing their wealth, you look at your whole portfolio, right? And mm. obviously, naturally, people might start with your, like, look at index funds and stuff as they begin investing for the first time. And then they structure their portfolio with the more alternative and riskier um, assets on one side as well, where and crypto falls into that. And now, like, I want to sort of explore the idea of what other alternative assets mean. Mm. And art is obviously one that a very sm we call it a small cohort of people um, have always considered, but most people just don't know about. Um, but I think yeah, it's worth it's worth like people becoming educated on it. Yeah, look, it's not as it's not as hard as people think. I think it's probably one of the most straightforward and simple luxury yeah. asset classes to invest in, yeah. and a lot easier to maintain. You know, compared to a classic car, yeah, where you need yeah, a bloody yeah. big space, a watch where you probably have to get service every six months. Yeah. Sure. Um, and you know, wine where you need a bloody, bloody big seller and you can't even enjoy it. Yeah. It's just kind of collecting dust where the best thing about art is you get something that you really love on yeah. your wall and I cannot stress that enough. I will never sell a piece of art to a client if they don't like it. Yeah. You know? I've sadly dealt with lots of big collectors who will never see the work. It will go straight into a storage facility in, in Switzerland or somewhere. Yeah. And it's a big shame. So, uh, so long as they're hanging in the home, I'm happy. Yeah. But the best thing about it, you buy it, you hold it, you put it on the wall, Apart from maybe not putting it in direct sunlight if it doesn't have yeah, a frame, yeah. you watch it glow, watch it grow, and then I will come back to you in five months, five years time, yeah. whenever you know we have discussed when that work be ready to sell. Yeah, we take it from there. That's so. That, see, that's really interesting because I think with things like art, people are just like, well, what do I do when I want to make money from exactly. it? Exactly. Like, how do you? How do I go about selling it? So like, what is? So, so for someone who has no idea, let's say me, I, I I'm sort of like I am actually like hoping and want like to invest in art at some point 
um, and I'm coming into it like completely new. Um, but I've got, let's say I've got two grand that I want to buy a piece of art. And I actually like art, so it's going to sit in my home. So I'm, I'm a good customer. Perfect. Excellent. <laughs> um, but I, it's something that, let's say, uh, I would want to sell in a couple of years' time. How, how would I go through that process? From the buy and sell side, well, obviously, it's always good to have somebody in the industry that you know. Yeah. Um, doesn't matter if it's £2,000 or £2 million. And then, obviously, you've got to find out what kind of what kind of art you're looking for. What's your medium? Do you want street art? Um, something similar to your A-level projects. <laughs> do you want you know abstract? Do you want pop art? Do you want something slightly more classic from kind of the modern movement? And then um, you kind of take it from there. So maybe start going around galleries, get a feel for kind of what galleries would work for you. And obviously, thanks to the website, pretty much all of that now is yeah. at a fingertip. So. Um, a great company um, to work with is Artsy. It's the largest online yeah. marketplace platform where really you can find any artwork, both yeah. for buy and sell side. So if you type in Andy Warhol or Banksy, yeah. it will come up with every single gallery listed with them that has that in particular work for sale yeah. or has had for sale or coming up at auction. Yeah. So you get a really good understanding for you know the price, yeah. you know what kind of galleries are pricing these works at, where is it in London, and then you get a good understanding is, you know, if it's a popular piece, mm -hmm. if it's abroad, if it's an international um, marketplace, and then you go from there. And then you can speak to online consultants who will hopefully guide yeah. the way through from... See, that's what I had no idea about. And that's amazing to know is that I think most people, when it comes to things like art, they just think, well, I have no idea about art. I don't know anything about art. I look at something and I think it looks cool. Mm. But there is actually a support ecosystem at place with like advisors like yourself. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. I think um, obviously different galleries will cater for different clients. Yeah. Um, I think definitely if you're looking to start from the entry level, which is £2,000, you know, go to these kind of online places, do inquire. Clarinin for one, um, Artsy. You know, there's many other fantastic galleries out there that would you know, definitely cater to your needs. Yeah. And then, you know, you can go and meet them or have a chat via WhatsApp. And then, you know, it's really steps up. And, and step. there's an aftercare process where if your customer then obviously wanted to sell their piece of art, you can, you help with, you help with that process. <clears throat> I, I think what you need to be super aware on, and I think what people need to understand when they first start collecting is not every single piece of art is an investment. Yes, of course. Um, See, that's, that's a really important point. Actually. And people who go into it thinking they're going to make money probably won't. Yeah. So you have, maybe to break it down a little bit, yeah. you have your three kind of art classes, mm -hmm. submit your socks. You have your emerging artist, yeah. your established artist, yeah. and then you have your blue chip artist. Okay. So your emerging artist is literally what it says on the tin. Yeah. Somebody who's just got going, whether yeah. it be a local or international market, um, you can probably pick up an original for literally 200 quid, a couple of thousand pounds. Yeah. Um, they may be not represented by any gallery, yeah. hence why they're so cheap. So it's a bit of a punt, mm. but if you really truly feel you like it, go for it. But then again, you know, th there is no kind of solidified market behind it. Yeah. Then you have your established artists. These guys are collected you know, nationally, internationally, already have a great presence within the private market. Maybe have already seen some strong figures at auction, which is a really good um, kind of way to understand you know, how the artist is in the market. Yeah how the prices are going up, are they yeah. doing well? Did it go above the estimate, for yeah. example? Um, and normally then, if it's already established, you'd be paying slightly more. Yeah. Um, but again, you're buying a premium, you're buying the brand. Yeah, yeah. So that's that's still great, but you can still pick up great prices. Then last but not least is your blue chip stock. Yeah. Now these are names which you've heard of before, like Banksy, yeah. Andy Warhol, Jean-Marcel Basquiat, for example, Keep It Local, Damien Hurst, Tracy yeah. Emin, names which are just absolute legends and canons in. Yeah the art history have pioneered in a certain movement or have literally created a medium yeah. like Picasso, for yeah. example, which will ve very rarely, if ever, go down in value. Yeah. Now, obviously, originals for these are quite expensive, but you can pick up some really strong limited edition prints for you know, 2,000 up to 20,000 for these artists, yeah. which yeah. would be great. And I always think if you have the money, you have the capital to do it, it's always nice starting off with an established or a blue chip work, because you're not going to lose sleep at night. You know, yeah. It's a nice, easy, solid purchase, yeah. like your blue chip stocks, where you know it's not going to probably massively go up in value, yeah. but you know your money's safe. Yeah, that's that's a really interesting breakdown. And I'm going to take the role of the contrarian for a bit and, and sort of like probe you. So let's say like people who are just completely new to the world of art, and they're just like, well, ah, oh, it's just it's such a subjective like. Um, way of thinking, like approaching, like what is it that actually makes artwork expensive or go up in value? 
I think it's a number of factors. Um, it could be what, as I previously mentioned, what's that artist done for you yeah. know, said medium? Like Banksy, you know, he was an absolute PR machine. He's you know, created this kind of aura about no one knows who he is. Yeah, yeah. You know, in the late 90s, obviously the feeling of Britain at the time, he really kind of amplified that in his mm -hmm. drawings. And no one had really done anything like he'd done before. Yeah. Obviously there'd been street art, art free, which originated in France in the yeah. early 20th century. Um, but what he was doing at the time and using political messages and kind of really getting the public behind him was, you know, well, synonymous with the 90s and noughties. Yeah. And because of that, he became great because no other artist was doing what he was doing. Yeah, yeah. Um, and that, I think, makes artists stand out. It's the originality, yeah. the uniqueness, stand out from the crowd. And like, there's a crazy statistic such as 95% of artists will never succeed. They will, yeah, they'll fail yeah. because it's such a tough market to yeah. make your work stand out from the rest. Yeah. So you need, obviously, a great bit of marketing. Yeah. Uh, you need you know, great auction results, somebody that you know, has really kind of been a master in that movement. So, so do you think part of it, actually, isn't necessarily just the work? It's the actual artist as well? It's 100% both. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. You know, I've, I've met you know, some incredible artists yeah. that, you know, from our age up until 50s, yeah. and that they haven't quite got there yet. Even yeah. though their artwork is amazing, yeah. it's just you, know, you need a, something about you. Yeah. You, know, you need kind of a great story, as you would say in art, authenticity and provenance, yeah. you know, needs to be spot on, such as Picasso, you know, he pretty yeah. much works his way through the five movements, you yeah. know, you look at Andy Warhol, what he did for the 1680s at the yeah. time, Basquiat, you yeah. know, Keith Haring, you know, in a short period of time, these guys exploded onto the scene, yeah. um, not just with his, their artwork, but, you know, political messages, yeah. you know, for example, Basquiat being a very taboo, you know, a, a black artist in the 80s, yeah. you know, wasn't really thought of before, him paving the way for future generations of black artists, yeah, and yeah. that's why, He's so highly regarded now, and that's why Gagosian took him on in the yeah. early 80s because he really saw something in him. Yeah, that's see, that's so interesting. So, and, and, and that's something I think to note for people who are always very confused by art and sort of are looking at pieces and thinking, what is it about this that makes it so expensive? There mm. is it goes beyond the art, and it's actually like perhaps it's it's worth understanding the context beyond the art, and a, a lot of what has to do with the value and of artwork is actually the artist as well and what they represent and what they're doing. Absolutely. Um yeah. 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 And, and and then also added to that, would you agree that for a lot of people there is a, a it's a it's a status symbol as well? Yeah, I think obviously you you know, everyone buys art for different reasons. Mm -hmm. I think hopefully you and I would buy artwork because it looks great in the yeah. home and hopefully would, you know, give us a good return at some point in the yeah. future. Um but I think very much others um, in the kind of upper echelon mm -hmm. um, who are buying, you know, hundred thousand multi million dollar works. Sometimes we'll be using it to kind of solidify themselves in this kind of you know high society yeah. um, where they feel maybe they're not good enough, they're not kind of adequate. Yeah. Um, as I was saying uh, before, you had these kind of in the early 20th century, the big you know financial magnates such as Rockefeller, J.P. Morgan, yeah, yeah. BNY Mellon, Frick, people that you know we have heard of, and the banks are still very much going today. These guys were first generation wealth. You know, yeah, they yeah. didn't have money. blue bud yeah. coursing through their veins. <laughs> and that really annoyed them because they were obviously at the dinner parties. Yeah. They were at the kind of the balls in New York and the yeah. UK and Europe with the aristocrats. So what they did to kind of, you know, make sure they felt like yeah. they were, you know, meant to be there is house these incredible collections of artworks yeah. and spend millions if not billions of today's money on yeah. works and now that's why you see in yeah. new york the frick collection the bny collection um because they have some of the most impressive artwork at that time in europe it's, it's the story of gatsby right yeah um and it's so funny to think of jp morgan and rockefeller as new money at one point yeah it, they they were and they really hated it and yeah. it's fascinating there was one of my favorite art dealers um one of my heroes uh, was a chap called joseph devine yeah. who just saw a very simple problem and an acted on it that yeah. European aristocrats were broke but yeah. had a lot of artwork yeah. and America had a lot of new money yeah. and he just simply paired the two together. That's so sweet. Um, so that these beautiful Gainsborough's, you know, uh, 18th century rock pieces were going from these broke aristocrats who were those roof was tumbling in through to the US yeah. and they're selling the works. That's, yeah, that's super smart. And it's so mm. funny because now you might be seeing with these crypto millionaires, crypto billionaires coming through, mm. um, 
that again there's a whole like new age of new money again as well yeah absolutely we're seeing that and also you look you've got to look at art as a demograph in terms of the location so hong kong over the last 20 years have just exploded yeah um both at private seller auction what we're seeing now is really interesting is seoul becoming a really strong really? hub yeah I was researching it last week you know they have uh, bars are there they have kind of the seoul um art fair which happens every year wow and you know they're seeing a massive demand not just for local artists but western yeah. art that's, so, it's, that's so interesting because they've done amazing to like export their culture generally in the yeah, last few years. Yeah, yeah. Um, so that's really interesting to see that the art world exploding there as well. Yeah, I so, think that's a big one to watch. Yeah. Hong Kong has obviously solidified the presence there as kind of a huge kind of place for obviously kind of, you know, middle class, you know, wealthy um, Chinese and Hong Kong is looking to find art. But Seoul, I think, is the next one. That's amazing. Yeah. That's really, yeah. So being a bit like Cheeky, what have you? What's the most expensive piece of art that you've either sold or seen sold? <laughs> However yeah. much you can share. I'm going to have to be careful here. Yeah. Um, I, I probably would. I would say um, pushing the six, seven figure mark, and it was wow. um, a Banksy gold balloon, which was pretty, pretty strong work. Iconic as well. Yeah, that's it was crazy. Banksy's strongest piece he's ever done. It was pretty special. That's it's just nice to be, you know, in the presence of a work like this and kind of see it firsthand. That's a insane. piece which I think was rated Britain's most favorite piece of art and yeah. something which has literally um, defined a movement and emblematic of his entire artistic career. That's insane. Quite special. Yeah, that's mad. Yeah. Do, you, do you see a lot of Banksy's being bought and sold in the private market? I think there was a massive surge since 2018. You yeah. must have heard of the Banksy shredding. Yeah. Uh, so at Sotheby's, uh, an original Goa balloon sold. And as the hammer went down, um, there was a beeping in the room. Yeah. And the piece started to shred. Yeah. And it stopped right at the bottom. Um, so Banksy would have been at that auction and no one knew it. And he was the one with the buzzer ticking it. And obviously then everyone was going, what's going on? This is mad. Especially the people who just forked out a million quid for the work going, yeah. Seeing the work just slowly disintegrating, I can imagine it was a um, heart in mouth moment. Yeah. But then the next day they came out, they rebranded it from um, Lovers in the Air to Lovers in the Bin 2018, and it doubled in price overnight because. So the, the shredded piece? Yeah. And it was on display. That is I think crazy. Sotheby's kind of knew what was going on. Yeah, uh, and they were like, oh gosh, this is amazing. This was, it was the first time a work had ever been renamed at auction. Um, the collectors who bought it, obviously a couple from, I think, Europe, I think it was uh, Switzerland or Sweden, uh, were originally like, that's ridiculous. Um, but Wasn't then that it, quite a gamble? Because what if they were just like, no, I'm pissed off, I want the... Well, that's interesting. That where That's where, well, obviously you're at law. This is where the law side and the legislation of the art world comes into play. So as the gabble goes down, as the hammer goes down, that is the contract ended with Sotheby's. That is their agreement and um, kind of tenure finished so then it's the responsibility of the it is responsibility of the collectors and so he waited until the gabble had gone that down that is insane this is why so he was quite clever doing that and Sotheby's were not liable in that case yeah. I'm sure their court court case could have been brought but technically they were fine they were well, they not. also made a million quid overnight uh they just yeah and and the collectors made a million quid overnight and then you could you've gone to, you could have gone to see it for a month at Sotheby's they had kind of put it on display and it actually looked pretty cool. Yeah. And then it sold, I think it sold this year or last year for three or four times what these guys bought it for. That is crazy. Yeah. That is insane. Yeah. That is insane. Absolutely I'd, mental. I'd, I'd love to like to have seen it. Obviously any, anything Banksy does just goes viral anyway. Yeah. Um, that's, yeah, that's crazy. Mm. Um, good to get some insight on it as well. Um, <laughs> so another thing sort of I'm, I'm curious about, like how do you think digitalization has impacted art? Obviously, we've seen the crazy explosion of NFTs that came through, which I think obviously like people still don't entirely understand NFTs um, and it's fairly nascent, but it has shown how like explosive it can be. Obviously, we had uh, um, a piece by Beeple, um, which many people know about. Yes, uh, which went yeah. for 69.2 million at Chrissy's sale last summer. 69.2 million. Like, what on earth makes a digital art piece worth 69 million dollars? Like? Can I just say, with that sale, by the way, this guy has just never been heard of as of yeah. three years ago. Um, he was working from his kind of house from home uh, in marketing. Um, that shot him up to becoming the most, the third most expensive living artist ever. Uh, behind Jeff Koons and David Hockney. This guy just comes out of the ethos and it, it's just incredible that an NFT, 
what has been going for, to, you know, NFT has been going for two or three years, yeah, yeah. maybe a bit longer, but has really been in kind of the commercial retail spotlight for that long, has just commanded such a huge figure. And the guy who bought it, um, I believe, funnily enough, works in tech. Oh, really? um, yeah, <laughs> um, I think he works for kind of a kind of a trading platform of some sort. I can't yeah. quite remember his name, um, but you know they've. I think NFTs, for me, um, and what I've spoken to with kind of colleagues in the market, quite simply is just an asset. It is not a piece of art. Mm -hmm. It's just like Bitcoin, mm -hmm. a store of digital wealth. You know, it's a JPEG with an image, but with kind of. Yeah. I I I, I yeah I think it's just um, people are buying it purely for status. You know, yeah. the reason why I love art is just yeah. like you. I get home from, funny enough, looking at a screen all day. Yeah. yeah. Um, the last thing I want to do is look, look at, at the screen. screen. Yeah. And so I would much prefer to have this beautiful piece on the wall, yeah. which is kind of a physical asset that you can enjoy. But again, it's a story of wealth. It's kind of the yeah. decentralization of the financial market. Hence. You know, the people, I think it's 85% of people that buy NFTs also buy Bitcoins, which is a crazy correlation. You know, yeah. people aren't buying it who have a classic collection of art, yeah, as yeah. In a physical art. Yeah, that's interesting. It's interesting to get your take on that as well, actually, because I think it's still <coughs> such a divisive topic in an area. Um, I'm inclined to agree with you. I think NFTs, I don't think it's digital art as people have sort of like defined it. I think it's actually NFTs as a whole will become a success because of the utility of the technology I rather think, than the actual... Yeah, um, and that's where blockchain art. comes into it yeah. too, which is actually now being implemented into the art market. That's so crazy. obviously you know what blockchain yeah. is. It's just a, you know, a ledger where you know, each piece of information before is stored and literally cannot be tampered with. Yeah. And obviously that's great in the art world when you're dealing with a Picasso, which is yeah. 200 years old. Yeah. Sometimes yeah. it could be a fake or yeah. sometimes there could be a bit of kind of yeah. rubbing out. So with blockchain, this enables, again, if you're purchasing online yeah. um, for the first time, it just makes things so much more straightforward, yeah. transparent, and most importantly, safe yeah, yeah, if absolutely. you've never bought before. And it verifies that. Yeah, and it verifies that. So I think this is what we're going to see in the next couple of years. People who yeah. buy online, which is, as I've spoken to you before, yeah. through digitalization, really straightforward and simple. Yeah, It's, it's you know, from the pre-post-sale, consultant chatting to you all the way through yeah. um you can buy through payment link invoice bank transfer credit card i mean it's so straightforward yeah and then all the way up until delivery whether it be in-house at that gallery or a third-party delivery company such as queens convelio yeah could i can take you know there's many out there which yeah. do a proper silver service job up into your door um and that's the i think what's doing really that's, really well at the moment. that's that's great yeah it's really interesting and i do i do think there's definitely like a utility for that across many industries mm. as well mm. um so i think it's, it's definitely watch this space in terms of like distributed ledger technology 100 um but have you come across any fakes in the other? um uh, i i've seen a couple online <laughs> uh luckily can you tell like uh, or like there's i i think the fakes tend to be in where there's the most limited edition print. So okay. you, what, what a limited edition print is, is maybe what well, Banksy is a prime example. You know, you have his originals, you know, spray paint on canvas, mm. stencil on canvas, acrylic on canvas or oil, whatever it may be, or just on a piece of wall. Yeah. You know, these are going from millions upon millions of pounds and obviously way out the price back of lots of people. Yeah. So what an artist would do in that case is create a limited edition print run of said work. Okay. Or even not create an original and just do limiteds. Now, these could be through many kind of processes from a lithograph, which is probably the oldest form of printing where you create this kind of stone block, etch into the piece, put the paper down, press it really yeah. hard, and that's the imprint. So that's the lithograph. A silkscreen print is where you're kind of going yeah, with yeah. different stencils yeah. over and over again. And that was to find by Andy Warhol and Keith Haring as kind of the commercialization of the art market, making art for everyone. And that's mm -hmm. what Warhol wanted to do. Uh, so let's go with that, for example. So Banksy created Full Girl of Balloon, yeah. 500 editions, 150 signed, yeah. 350 unsigned. Okay. Um, the signs are now going for about half a million. The unsigned are now going for, for about £200,000 for a limited edition crazy. print from a bleach of artists. That, so it's some people think of it, specifically what Damien Hirst has been doing yeah. the last few years, is literally a license to print money. Um, but these have acted as great investments if you got in at the right time. Yeah. So you could have bought a Banksy, um, another really lovely screen print by him is Choose Your Weapon. Yeah. It's um, um, a, a yob of some sort, you know, holding a dog, but it's a Keith Haring dog. So yeah, it's a yeah. really clever kind of motif and his weapon is art. And that's yeah. why it's Choose Your Weapon. So it's a really yeah. cool work. Came out in 2011. You could have bought that 
um, for five thousand pounds back in two thousand eleven. Yeah. Now they're changing for one hundred twenty five thousand pounds. That is honestly crazy. Like that's it's, it's, yeah, it's incredible. Um, so this is where we start to think: Is there a boom, mm -hmm. or is there a bust going to come? Mm -hmm. So is there a bubble? So going back to your last question. Why has Banksy grown so much? Um, I think it's obviously through the shredding. And over the last few years, his prices have gone up and up and up. But what we're now seeing this year is a dip. Okay, um, so we're actually in a dip at the, the moment. The market's okay, massively wow. cooling off. You can see this through um, public sales at Phillips, Bonhams, Christie's and Sotheby's. Wow. Uh, the prices are now cooling down and becoming more realistic for what you should be paying for that piece of work. And this is a good thing. This is just thinking long term for the artist because yeah. if it kept on going, there could have been a but, yeah, yeah, and you're the last person with a Banksy print at two hundred thousand pounds. Yeah. So you know, give it another couple of years, and I yeah. guarantee you there'll be some another piece of incredible publicity. Yeah. Or something will happen, yeah. or he'll reveal his name, maybe. Yeah. yeah. And then <laughs> again, this market will go back. That's been one of the smartest things because for, for as long as I've like known of Banksy, one of the main things is that no one knows who he is, and this whole like mystery around his identity. Um, whether he's a few people or one, like there's there's always been loads of theories, right? I think there's I think there's definitely a team of people, yeah. but he's the guy with the idea, and he's the guy kind of making all of this happen. So fair play to him. Yeah, mate, fair play <laughs> to him. Um, I want to dive into something which is really interesting across like the investing world, um, the idea of fractionalizing investing into any kind of asset. Now, I actually, until we spoke, had no idea that this was the case in artwork as well. So fractional investing, I think, has exploded in recent years when it comes to like investing into traditional assets like stocks and shares. So now you can buy um, a small fraction of a company. Historically, like, like um, decades ago, traditional investing, you'd look at buying whole shares in companies and, 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 and like you'd be like quite an active shareholder in a company, for example. Let's say you bought um, stock in, I don't know, GM Ford. Mm. Um, you'd, you 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 might turn up to like shareholder meetings and try to influence the direction of the company, um, and you'd you'd hold like significant shares to do so, and then obviously in the in the current advent of investing, you can buy fractional shares, which means you can buy based on the, however much you can afford from pennies up to like um, uh, hundreds of pounds mm. um, in shares in certain companies, but you're quite a passive investor. You don't actually have to actively do anything because you're passively investing into said company. Now I've seen this transferred across to loads of other assets, but I had not considered that you can become a fractional owner of artwork, mm. but, mm. but but that that's happening now. Yeah, absolutely. I think um, it's kind of been in, in the background of the market for a couple of years, yeah. but there's now a couple of companies, one particularly in the UK, which um, there seems to be getting a lot of traction. Yeah. And, um, not only have they now become FCA regulated, the board is all not just art, but you know, come from investment backgrounds, yeah. you know, serious companies in, in yeah. Europe. So they've got you know a great team behind them, and it is quite simply the fractionalization of the market. And with these guys in particular, you're owning shares in something that you you and I probably will never be able to own. Um, you know, we're talking twenty million pound Edward yeah. Munch, uh, Andy Warhol, Basquiat, yeah. some really incredible masterpieces yeah. and the minimum investment for these guys is two thousand yeah. pounds going up from there and the whole time they recommend is two to seven years okay um so whatever whatever um that you know your investment would equate into y of, of shares and you're probably thinking but how do i get my return yeah, yeah so it's very straightforward again um the work will obviously increase in value yeah just like a stock you know, over time yeah uh, as the market goes forward uh, like we've seen it with Andy Warhol or many other artists. And then you can get your dividend or your return, if you would like to sell, when that piece either goes to auction yeah, okay. uh, or sells through private sale. That's so that's so interesting. Yeah. yeah. Um, so they recommend on these big works, obviously, if you want to make sure your you know, capital grows and you get a good return, yeah. it's a minimum hold of two to seven years. And obviously, sometimes... The market goes through cool mm. phases, hot phases, and with art as well. Some art sometimes, you know, takes years to get back into the spotlight or yeah. won't be very hot. You know, there's a good saying: Picasso is just, you know, slow and steady wins the race. You know, yeah. it will go up. It, consider it like a bond in the market. Yeah, you know, okay, it, it's okay. low risk, good low analogy. return, right? Yeah. Uh, where you have more explosive artists such as Basquiat, which have done very well, yeah. uh, Banksy in the last couple of years, which will go through, you know, incredible growth stages. Consider 
um, maybe before the beginning of this year, a tech growth stock. You know, yeah, something yeah, which yeah. Uh, lots of people piled into, massively put it up the share price. Yeah. But now at the moment, not looking very hot, right? Yeah. So that's probably what you know I'd affiliate with Banksy at the moment. Okay, okay, um, so they say, you know, to weather out the peaks and troughs, yeah. you hold for two to seven years, and then when it goes to auction, that's where you get your capital returned. That's 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 so so interesting. Because um, now I don't know if you've seen this. I watched on. I was just like in a YouTube rabbit hole. Um, and um, always the way to go. Yeah, <laughs> Logan Paul, the infamous YouTuber, he's actually set up um, a platform to enable people to have fractional ownership of any asset. And he and the big thing that led his one is he's massively into Pokemon cards. He is. So he's got this like really rare Pikachu. He's like got around his. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So he's basically put that on the market, and he's um, said you can own this one of one really rare Pikachu, which was worth two million dollars. But he's kept forty nine percent ownership. So this idea of fractional investing is like hitting the mainstream um, and like popular mediums. I think uh, hopefully I've seen more companies start to kind of fledge, which would have even less barriers for entry, maybe two hundred pounds, five hundred pounds. But yeah. Again, I can imagine just like um, with you and anyone else looking to go to investments, do your research first. Yeah, yeah. If you're happy to hold, if you if you're happy to chuck two, three grand away and forget yeah. about it for five years and maybe get a great return, fine. Yeah. But you know, if that capital could be better spent or kind of utilized elsewhere, yeah. um, such as a, a mortgage or, yeah. or something, then, then I'd go for it. I think it's um, um, a good a good place to go. Specifically, art has been always known as an inflation hedge. Yeah, okay, um, okay that's interesting. Um, also been you know, used as a tax haven. Okay, yeah. Very much so. Okay. Um, again, for maybe not you and I, but the ultra high net worth who, you know, they've got a lot of money to hide, will invest in multi-million pound art yeah. um, and it's a great place to store you know wealth over generations yeah. and Hannah Dam quite simply. That's actually so interesting because how do you, you can't necessarily tax art if you're handing it down like that because it's a physical though I'm, I'm sure there's some point in not, not even death duties if it was given to you seven years before I think yeah. that's a general consensus but I think on luxury goods specifically with art it's a it's a great it's a great way and also it's a great way to offset tax. So, yeah. for example, um, if you have a very large collection of art, yeah. um, you can maybe open your house up or give it to a museum for six months for the public to see. Yeah. And then you do a deal with said government or said institution, and that will massively offset your tax for that year because you're letting people um, see this most incredible collection. Yeah. And again, what people do to kind of bring their costs down and yeah, yeah, yeah. It's, making sure this artists so you're, you're, you're opening up the curtain and giving us a view into this yeah <laughs> it's um it's um it's really interesting when you start to do because i i am whilst in the industry i did a course with chris is in art law and art market economics and then from there you really start to see okay this is this is why people do this yeah, and, yeah. Um, this is why it's been a playground for rich for Two, three hundred years. Centuries. You know, that's just why, you know, Switzerland is a free port, isn't it? In terms mm. of tax, fun enough, this is where some of the biggest art, art collections collection. are housed because you pay minus 20% on a piece of art. So long as it's stayed in Switzerland, stored in Switzerland, yeah. um, it's, um, again, another tax haven. That's so interesting. So do, do you own art yourself? I do. I do. Not at the upper echelon, but I'm yeah. sure I'll get there at some point. Um, I'm very lucky to own... Um, I like investing in British art. Okay, nice. Um, so we, anything from the Connor Brothers, Tracy Emin, uh, David Hockney, Damien Hurst, Harlan Miller. It's one of my yeah. favourites. Um, not, Banksy, not quite yet, but we're going to get there. Hopefully soon. Yeah. I think it's fun picking up pieces, uh, you know, at entry level. And I'm lucky enough to, I suppose, have a foot in the door, which I think mm. it looks great. And I love these pieces, but I will say very much will see it as a part of my portfolio too. That's amazing, and obviously having an insight into that mm. is, is is super super useful. Which I know some of your friends have benefited. From they have, well. yeah. I've um I've definitely tried to get some of my mates, and they've done fairly well so far. Um, what have you made your money? Have you made money in any of them? Not necessarily by selling, but like um, that you've seen go up in value. Um, yeah, through both. There's there's a couple of pieces which I bought um about six months ago, uh, at six thousand pounds for 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 both. And they've both doubled in value, which is great. Sick. Um, again, I think it's about picking art at the right time. And because obviously I'm in the market, I can see, okay, this is probably yeah. a good time to get into said work. I think I've done one on a David Hockney, um, David Trigley, who's another great yeah. um, artist. And that 
again, is a, you're getting a great work. Yeah. Um, and it, the, probably the reason why you make money is it was a limited edition print, a, a print run release, just like a watch release or a yeah, trainer's yeah. release. Obviously, you want to get in on the primary market. So yeah, the primary yeah. market is you're the first one to buy it, you know, yeah. whether it be straight from the auction house, the gallery or the, the artist. Yeah. And then as soon as you bought it and then you resell it, that's the secondary market. Yeah. So it's always good to try and get in on a primary market release. Mm -hmm. So you're buying at two, three thousand pounds, reselling at five, six thousand pounds in a couple of years' time. That's amazing. See, Ed's making well doubling his money in, in artwork and I'm buying high tech or well, high growth tech stocks and sitting at eighty percent loss. Part of it's the been, way to go, it's mate. Been, uh, <laughs> sad I get my hard grease lands done on a daily basis. I've oh, kind of mate, deleted I'm just I'm ignoring my trading yeah, too for a good. while. <laughs> <laughs> um, no, that's super interesting. So let's say for a complete newbie. Yeah. Which I would count myself as, but let's say complete newbie. Um, how do you think people should go about? They're, they're, they're interested. They're, they've you've piqued their interest. Sure. Um, and they want to like look into the world of art. Like, where, what do you think are the things that they need to consider, and, and where do you think they should start? Firstly, yeah, absolutely. Um, come speak to me. Yeah. <laughs> Find out what you like. Yeah. You know, there's so much artwork out there. You might have been influenced or seen something which you've never realized is actually quite accessible. Yeah. Um, again, go on these online websites such as Artsy, um, Artnet, um, many others, or just type in set art test yeah. into Google and see who's selling them. Yeah. And then there will always be some advisor, consultant, somebody to help you go down the rate. You understand maybe the price, what budget is obviously a really good idea, giving yourself a budget where you're very happy just to invest and forget about or even not make money on. I think when you go into investing, you've got to be able to, you know, yeah. feel that you can lose this money. Yeah, yeah. And Don't we, invest any more that you're comfortable with. That's really good. And we, we always do say that with investing, you have to think of it. We're not trading assets here. It's a long-term game. It's a long-term game. Um, and it's no different whatever asset yeah. that you're buying into. Obviously, you know, sometimes you get lucky and you'll be able to sell a work within six, 12 months, but that's what we call flipping. And sometimes, mm. you know, if you've got a, a primary market print run, mm -hmm. that's a prime example. But I think when you're buying a secondary piece, um, right. you know, you're going to hold that for a long period of time. You don't want to flip too soon because that could be detrimental to the artist's career. It could saturate the market. Yes. Just what happened with Damien Hurst in 2012. Yeah. Um, and it took his market 10 years to recover. Wow. Now he's doing really well again. Because um, he cut out the minimum and went straight to Sotheby's and sold 100 million pounds worth of his work. Um, but obviously people saw that thought, brilliant, perfect time to me sell my Damien. And everyone did it, flooded the market, just no one bought Damien House for 10 years. Oh so God. buy with a view of a long-term hold. Um, and I always say, go for an artist that you love, but be aware that you know he could be established or he could be blue chip. So you know, it could go up in the valley at the same time as well. That's amazing. This has been full of such useful nuggets, man. Um, well, to, to wrap up, there's something that we... Uh, that we like to ask all of our guests, and um, I think for yourself, we can. I guess there's so, there's so much that you can teach us, but we like to um, ask for some loose change that you'd like to share with our audience. So that could be anything. Is there anything that you're reading, any programs that you're watching, or are there any artists, up and coming artists, that you think people should know about that you're that you're really enjoying at the moment? That's a really good question. I think um, for me, it's probably art. I think. What I love finding out is new artists on a monthly basis okay. coming through the woodwork, which I feel is quite cool. Um, and I've been reading a lot, a lot up on David Trigley, okay. who I think is just awesome at the moment. You know, he's really took the market by storm only in the last few years. So a British artist. He's uh, British, blue chip, oh, okay. and um, you can get these really fun works um, for two, three thousand pounds on the primary market. And uh, you know, they're appealing to everyone. What we call subjective. So he has. You know, these brilliant animals or slogans drawn in a very childlike, crude fashion. Okay, okay. But as a juxtaposition, touching on quite political or quite um, topical yeah. um, themes presently in this world. So it's a really cool mix. And he has just got the biggest collector base from our age the way up to 60. Yeah. Because it's childlike, it's fun. And I think in this day and age where everything is quite sad and serious at the yeah, moment, yeah, yeah. it's nice to have something quite rude and fun on the wall. Yes. And he completely empathizes that. And I think that's why he's doing really well. So if you're looking for a fun artwork, which is um, accessible in terms of entry level, David Trigley is your guy. That's amazing. Definitely someone I'm going to be checking out. Well, Ed, it's been an absolute pleasure. Good I have learned so much. Honestly, you've covered so much <laughs> in such a short space of time. But thank you so much for joining us. Absolute pleasure. Season two of Loose Change. And thank you guys for listening. <laughs>